Well, we are back in Deeside and behind me is Jubilee Bridge, also known as the Blue Bridge for some reason. But we're not here to talk bridges. We are here to revisit Grainway Cycles to have a look at his absolute stunning collection of Vitus bicycles. Graham was an importer of the brand and has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. So without further ado, put the kettle on, let's get over to the shop and make ourselves a brew. Well, Graham, hello again. Thanks again for letting us in and giving us a little bit of your time. Before we actually start though, because I know you pulled me up on Colnago, uh, is it Vitus, Vitus? What, how, how does it go? Right, well, it depends on your nationality, I would say. Okay. I mean, we say Vitus, right? And that's what we're, we're it's like Vitus dance, Saint, Saint Vitus. But if you were in France, it was Vitus. All right, right? okay. Yes. Now, so it's anywhere in between those two. And if, if you said Vitus in England, more than half of the cyclists wouldn't know what you were talking about. Right, so, so before we actually get on to your wonderful collection of uh, bicycles again, um, just a little bit of, I uh, wanted to ask you, first of all, about the company itself and also how you got involved um, with the brand itself. Yes, well, it, it actually, uh, it, when I knew we were going to be talking about Vitus, it made me mentally revisit the 80s and how I came to get the distributed for, Brighter, for Vitus and uh, the other products that we did. Okay. In the early 80s, there was a very strong... Uh, in the in business, a very a number of very strong wholesalers, and they didn't like D side cycles amongst other discounters right. because okay. we we uh, they were used to the days of the sixties and seventies with resale retail price maintenance. Right. So you couldn't discount, and then when that disappeared, all of a sudden you could discount, and they but they had no control over it, and they didn't want to supply me with Campag, with Shimano with all of Mavic and things like that. Fortunately, um, Barry Hoban put me in contact with a wholesaler in Belgium. Right. And I visited the wholesaler. And in those days, all the business was done in French. And they they actually had Campag and Shimano and Vitus and all, all sorts of things. All Italian products, they, had, they were a bit a major port force in Belgium. Okay. And they agreed to supply me. One of the products was Vitus. At the time, we could only get a Peugeot, a Peugeot 979 as a complete bike. Right. You couldn't supply the frame. I think and we've touched on that. I was the, was it like the right. gold they were or bronze ones? color. They bronze were the bronze color, color yeah. yes. And, and uh, I mean, at that point, I assumed it was a Peugeot. You didn't think any more about it. It was just the Peugeot 979. Um, but then I saw when, when I went to Belgium that they had blue and red and black and silver. And uh, I started to buy them, and it was extremely popular. Although at that point in time, Sean Kelly wasn't riding on one. He okay. he, he was uh, that this was early eighties. I mean, the frame was introduced in at the, just in the the end of the nineteen seventies, nineteen seventy nine. Hence the number nine seven nine September oh, right. okay. September seventy nine. And they had their first pro win in nineteen eighty when. The Belgian Herman van Springle won the Bordeaux Paris riding, uh, or Bordeaux Paris, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, on a Vitus, on a Vitus frame. Okay. Um, Kelly was riding for Splendor, so he was riding on a, a steel bike at the time. So, around about, it was around about 82 or something like that, 82, 83, um, Kelly started riding for um, uh, Sem Francois, who used a uh, a Vitus bike, right, and that was when he started first started using all of the French equipment. Okay, because the French were quite chauvinistic about their 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 own manufactured product, and they tried to use wherever possible French things. Right. So they had Hutchinson or Walba tubulars, Mavic rims. I mean, Ideal saddles. You know, Raydell saddles. Right. right. Uh, CLB, which was. Uh, and CLB was actually the name of the guy. They were a company uh, that in, in Saint Etienne who cast aluminium. Okay. They cast aluminium. Right. And the people will, in the UK will know CLB for their brakes. Okay. But it was Claude Louvier Bouguin. That was the, or something like that. That was the CLB. Right. Um, 
and and they, so I was I started to buy my friends in Belgium went and went with the pe my the people I was dealing with in, in Belgium to a, the show in France and I think it was 1982 the Paris bike show and they the at that point the guy I was dealing with in Belgium said look you're buying so many frames why don't we just introduce you to to Vitus and see whether they'll supply you and their agreement with Peugeot had literally just run out. Right. Their, Peugeot's exclusivity for the 979 in the UK had, had run out. So they were looking for someone to distribute. And I, I knew I had a market, gave them us, and that's when it started. Yeah. And that was a, a long relationship I had with them. You know, yeah, I, mean, I mean, in all honesty, I've, I've seen quite a lot of the Graham Way bicycles from the Vitus yeah. era. That's well, on the eBay. I mean, switch, buying, switch forward. 10 to 12 years to when I actually lost the agency. Um, I mean, we there was a there were so many variations to to stock 979 and then the subsequent models, the 992 and of course the 797, which was a cheaper uh, cheaper variation, which they okay. initially introduced as a cyclocross frame and then as a road frame. Okay. Uh, the Futural was the name that they used for it. But. Um, there were by then there were about ten or twelve colours, ten or twelve sizes. Right. There was a road bike, a track bike, a road low pro, a track low pro, carbon three, carbon nine, in all of those as well. Right. Okay. So before you knew it, I mean my warehouse I had probably six to eight hundred frames hanging yeah, up. Wow. Okay. You know, it was a it was a very big business. We yeah. sold lots and lots of frames. And lots and lots of bikes with Gra and, and if we put Graham Way on it, people wanted it. Yes. Yeah. But it clearly wasn't a Graham Way, it was a Vitus. But as part of the promotion, I was fortunate enough to have some of the top riders of the day, Ben Luckwell, Chris Boardman, amongst the, amongst others, uh, Stuart Coles. They rode on Graham Wade Vitus. Right. And they would get front pages on the cycling, winning big races and so on. Yeah, wonderful. And yeah, yeah. so I, I remember clearly sitting in the, in the office with the, the then managing director, who was the son of Antoine Dumas, who sort of started the business so this was Gerard Dumas and him saying him saying to me um, we only speak French here by the way you know and uh, what what uh, what are you ordering for this year and I needed maybe a hundred French to top up okay and they they he said to me yes but I have someone in England who wants to buy 500 friends and I said well yeah but I have already 800 in stock I don't need to buy 500 friends I've already got a red 56 979, yes. I've already got four of them on the show, I don't need any more, kind of thing. Um, and he said, well, I, I'm not happy, you know, I, I, I don't think you are a, you know, I can re remember, even remember, un vrai, un vrai grossiste, a real wholesaler, mm. you know, you're not a real wholesaler. And I said, well, what makes you say that? He said, well, because every time I see a Vitus frame in your magazines, it has Graham Way on. Right. So, you know, the success we had in publicising the brand, yeah. using the top riders of the day, worked against me. Right. Because he thought they were, we were retailing them. And I said, well, I give those frames. Yeah. Those people, like, they don't buy those frames. You don't think Chris Boardman buys a frame. Right. You know, he's, you know he, I give him the bike hmm. to ride on, to publicise as a backup to the, all of those big d -side Cycles adverts that we used to have right. in the day. Yeah. So that's the long version. Okay. You know, so Vitus was a, Vitus when it started, it was a collaboration, and and you'll see on the bottom bracket, right, that it says Brevet Vitus, Fab France, so it means patented Vitus, okay. made in France, CLB, right. CLB cast the lugs. Okay. I mean, you look at a Vitus, you can see the one piece head tube, the seat lug, the bottom bracket, the rear, the front and rear ends. These were all cast in aluminium right. by CLB. Right. Yes. And yes, Bador yes. made the aluminium tubing. So, and initially, I don't think they even used them. I think it, the, when Persia started, it was Bador, not right. not nine seven nine. So it was a sort of collaboration, and you never really got to the bottom of who did what. And certainly, when I went to Saint Etienne, to the factory for the first time. Um, there was no evidence of ma of real manufacturing. It was just a an assembly. They had, right. they had jigs, big boxes of tubing, boxes of all the lugs, and they were all glued together. And yes. they went in an oven and all that. All and the things. Sent out the from there, yeah. 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 So I never went to the factory where they made the tubes. 
I never went to the factory where they cast the aluminium. Right. And of course, before they did aluminium or the aluminium bikes, Vitus were the sort of French Reynolds. Yes. Their tubing was used on, by everybody in France. Mm. Um, and in fact, there was a sort of like a cooperative called Manu France. And, and although I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but that was to encourage people to use, to, to network amongst yes. the French manufacturers. Right. So, so, uh, yeah, and, it's and understandable if it's obviously from France, then, yeah. This is, this was sort of, you know, while the EU was still, it was just sort of coming, it was just starting. Yeah. And I mean, there'd been a history of making bikes in France for obviously 180 odd, 100 years. And Saint Etienne was the center of, of, French site that's where the first bikes were made mm. and all of the big brands were in Saint Etienne to be yeah. honest it's one actual steel frame tubing the fact it's a uh, tubing that I've, I don't understand obviously you've got your Columbus and your SLX and your you know yeah. Renault 753 653 all that but uh, yeah the Vitus tubing is one I've never really understood or drummed down and actually no understand no, well, well the thing was Reynolds Reynolds was the was the Hoover the Hovis of right. tubing yeah. You know, nobody in England would buy a frame that didn't say Reynolds 531 on. 531 double butted and, and, and the Evolution 653 and so on. Yeah. And in Italy, nobody bought Reynolds, they bought Columbus. Yes. Right? Yeah. So in France, there were various tubing numbers, 671, whatever. I mean, yeah. they, they made tubing just as good as Reynolds and Columbus. Yes. And only in France did it have any, any uh, real status. O only in that country... Did, did it seem to have any status? Nobody was interested in, in Vitus frame, Vitus tube, uh, sorry, Vitus tubing. Yeah. Um, and then they changed from numbers to letters. They used GTI. GTI was their top. And that resonated. Right. Certainly Geos or Joss. Yes. I, I noticed a comment, someone saying, you know, how can you say Geos? It's right. Joss. Well, that's no different to Vitus okay. and Van Gogh. You know, but yeah. to me, it's Geos. And yeah. even when I was talking with, with, with uh, Marco or with, with uh, Fredo, I always said Geos. And they never said to me, oh, no, no, my name is Joss. <laughs> right. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know? So, so. Um, Comments come for Yeah, but, but they <laughs> certainly start. Yeah, they will do. They yeah. Fast, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, Geos certainly made frames in GTI right. for, a, for a period. And, and we, we started having, in, in our manufacturing in the UK, using the Vitus tubing. And because we got, real good deals on it yes. they wanted to to promote it in the uk but it didn't really sell you know no. it didn't really it didn't it didn't come up when, when it came up with vitus gti that someone was looking to buy a frame they would go for 753 or 653 or by then columbus sl or slx vitus was a uh, uh, the only way to sell it because you couldn't sell it on quality because people didn't understand the, right. the quality of the tubing and it was really really good tubing Mm. was by having it really cheap right and and of course yeah. as soon as you said it was 30 percent cheaper than 653 people assumed it wasn't as, it wasn't as good yeah yeah whereas really you could be making the profit and then oh, be yeah. bought into it all day yeah, long yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. so yeah. it, that was that was the that was the problem mm. and and whilst we flirted with vices tubing we ended up using it only in the low end frames um and not really making a big big fuss about it mm. because uh for us, in the UK, Vitus was was an was alloy. It was ubiquitous with Sean Kelly, and then when they came out with the carbons, that was well, I was going to mention Sean Kelly because we've actually done one of his uh, the Vitus nine seven nine, a, a white one, a cast one. We actually did a restoration on that. I had a lot of fun regards to dressing up in the cast team gear and taking it out. But what can you remember? What other riders obviously uh, use the the Vitus? Well, and anyone who wrote the. The, the progression of Sean's racing was mm. that he rode with, now let me just think, Saint Francois, Skill, okay. which was uh, Skill with That's people right, that make okay. the drills and the, the, that, so they were the big sponsor. That's right, yeah, the, yeah I remember the right. kit, yeah. The, yeah, the stripey kit. Yeah, so the, yeah. the bar going on. And then, the, then uh, the association with CAS, which is a Spanish drinks company. Right. Um, and um, I seem to recall that was the point at which the, f the frames had CAS on them. Yes. And that was because CAS bought the frames. Right, initially. okay, as, as you would. Yeah, because they bought the frames, okay. they put their name on it. And, and CAS was on the frames. Yes, it was ideal in that respect because for advertising and everything, it's perfect into the very just put the absolute... Vitus was, was a blank canvas frame. Yes. They were supplied, the only, the only stickers was the 
um, tubing designation on the top tube and a sticker on the on the top of the, the down tube, yeah. which said Bad or nine seven. Yeah, so they, they were basically more interested in actually advertisement of the actual material, the tubes itself, isn't it? That's yeah. That's fine, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the, yes, that's right. So, so then there was a number of years of cast, then Festina, and then when he moved from Festina to PDM, yeah. they, they were using Concorde frames, and whilst he did have some Vitus frames painted, right, just like Concords, most of the pictures show him on a steel. Concorde frame, right, which was uh, which was made in Belgium by Martelli, I, I think, or in Italy by by um, I can't remember now. It was made it, or it was made either in Italy or in Belgium, okay. probably both, right. And uh, and because PDM, the PDM team or the Concorde brand was was used by Veltec, okay, which was and Veltec was owned by the guy. People will, will possibly remember Plume Van Kerr as a, as the shop. The Mecca shop that people went to in Ghent okay. or Ghent. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I can't. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, well, no, if no, I'm, sure. you know, when you're there, it's Ghent. Yeah. When, when here, we say Ghent Bevelgum, nobody in Belgium would know what you were talking about. No. <laughs> no. 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 I say, I mean, you know, you know, you're obviously you're well travelled and you've had that personal experience of of these conversations with these people. So. Well, yes, and when you're in their country, it's a, it's really a sign of respect to try yes. to speak in their language. No, completely. So right. many years of working in France and Italy and Belgium gave me enough of the language to, to to not constantly be using English. Yes. Or, although towards the end of, of my business career, I found that virtually everybody I dealt with wanted to speak English. Right. right? They didn't want to speak in French or in Belgium or in Dutch or in Italian. Because they wanted to improve their English, yes. because the American market was growing, okay. and when you went to America, you spoke English. That yeah. was, you know, the, yeah. I mean, and so and so that was that was the evolution of it. Yeah. But uh, right, yeah. okay. Well, obviously, with what you've all been waiting for is the actual collection. So, quick question: How, how many actual bicycles, bicycles frames would you say that you have in your collection at the moment? Then, approximately. Mm. 20 maybe about, about 20 20 okay. uh, different because there were different as, as i said before um there was 979 future l 992 i don't have a zx1 there was a monocoque carbon okay um but they came out just at the point of time when we were stopping when we lost the agency okay. so we only ever had one we had a prototype okay. um so i never got them and, and as such i had a sort of I don't really want to have one here. <laughs> right. It reminds okay. me of, it if you it. like, it, it, it's a, you know, because I can remember when I went to San Etienne for that particular meeting, right. thinking, I'm going to buy 20 of these frames and, right. gonna, and, and I had plans for a team riding on them and so on. And in fact, the team did end up riding on them, but it was the Peugeot team. Right. The Peugeot team used them. Right. But um, anyway, that was, that was that's another that's story. Good. So um, obviously, we're, we're not actually going to go through all 20. No. Um, could you run us through uh, a selection of, yes, of a few? Yeah. Well, and, and they'll show the evolution. Okay. The, the initial, the initial nine seven nines. Okay. Had external cabling. Right. Uh, so there were top tube guides for the cables, and then the first evolution, the cables passed through the top tube. Okay. So, uh, so would second that first of all, you, you, you've actually got one. Yes, set. yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. So, so that one is around what? What year was that? That's so that'd be a seventy nine eighty. Seventy nine eighty, and you can tell that obviously because of the external cable routing, yeah. and also there's a seat post clamp. Yeah. Well, the seat seat post clamp, seat post clamp, or seat mm. clamp. Yeah. Or the seat lug. Okay. That did change, but that was a little later. Maybe okay. there were three or four years of of the old standard type seat lug where there were two uh, ears which clamped together and uh, as happens with alloy and titanium as well actually right it, it, it tightening up and loosening it tightening up and loosening it creates a fatigue and they started to break right and it was such a complex repair because as you can imagine a seat lug has two seat stays yes. a seat tube and a top tube going into it so it yeah. was a, a complex repair yeah um so there's a lot of stress going through that, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, so, mm. so consequently, uh, it was a very difficult repair to, to achieve because the tubes were very rigid, mm. so getting the lug out was difficult. Okay. And putting the new one in with the, with five, four tubes all at the same time, very difficult. Right, okay. But, um, so, yeah, so, so moving on from that first bike. Then yeah, what, so the what first bike had the external <coughs> cable guides. 
then the the next one had the internal cable guides okay um, which were which were fine provided you put the cables in properly into the into the, the into this because um, if you didn't when you pulled the brake up because the tubing was so soft the cable would would be in the wrong position and cut into the it would cut into it and in fact right. you can see that that on this on these frames right exactly what I mean that yeah. these have not been properly fitted and as such you know initially or maybe in some kind of maintenance time mm. they've not been been put in properly and and that's what happens you use your back brake yeah. so that was that then the the seat lug well you can see the change from this to this yes that was because these lugs these these ears would would crack right and you and you couldn't couldn't clamp the seat on. So, so was it a Mark One and Mark Two? Was a it Mark One and Mark, yes. Mark, Mark yeah. Two, yes. Yeah. So, so obviously we're onto this Mark Two now. Uh, so you've got the seat post lug, which was at the back there once mm -hmm. it was going through, and obviously the internal uh, tubing on the top tube. Yeah. Um, and on that Mark Two as well, I think they actually did. I think we've noticed one of your frame only has got the monocoque on the back. Is that right? Um, they did two versions. We've definitely got yeah. I've, I've, I've seen. I've seen I've oh yes, seen oh, I see what you the mean. Monocoque oh, but, oh yes. Well, right. sorry, I was just trying to think what you. Were, yeah, yeah. No. So above the brake bridge. Yes. Yes, above the brake bridge. Instead of having two tubes, there was one tube. That was the seven nine seven. All oh, right. Okay. Right? Or Futura. Right. right? Okay. Right. I don't actually have one of these built up as a bike. No. Um, it was the it was the entry level bike. And okay. It wasn't particular or entry level frame. It wasn't particularly successful. Okay. It w it was. I I'd asked them on many occasions whether they could make me a frame for the cyclocross market. Okay. Cyclocross was very popular in the eighties, as it is now. Yeah. But but then it's very popular and and Allen, the Italian manufacturer, they cornered the market completely. Right. And uh, obviously I couldn't run the Allen brand in parallel to the Vitus brand because Allen had road frames and I, and anyway there was a distributor for Allen in right. the UK and I respected his position okay. so I could I could pick them up funnily enough the Belgian people who, who uh, were my contacts and my suppliers in Belgium they did Allen and Vitus right okay yeah yeah <laughs> quite surprising and, Ge and Geos and Geos well. Well, right okay yeah. wow yeah so they they were you know they were big players in the market in the, in the 70s and 80s yeah because those brands you know the Geos brands, which we touched on in a previous video, was was used by a lot of the top teams. You know the Brooklyn team right. with uh, Roger De Vlaminck, and uh, who would won Paris Roubaix over and over again, and those and there was a top rider, sort of stand, Tour de France stage winner, and so on. He used Geos all the time, right? In, in, in for many of his many of the seasons, mm -hmm. and Allen was was used by the top cyclocross riders, right? You know they, uh, in fact, the Guerciotti brand that you see. Hmm. You know, Paolo Guicciotti was a top cyclocross rider, right? For Allen, yeah, yeah and, okay. and and then uh, and, and and then he, he, I think he was Italian champion, but not world champion. Okay. And and then when he went into business, it was natural that Guicciotti, just like Graham Way, would appear on the blank frame. Right. So you see Obviously, lots of Allen yes. frames with right. Guicciotti on. Yeah. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah Which so it's exactly. Yeah, it makes sense now. Yeah. yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's exactly where it came from. Okay, so uh, next bike, we we've got the Mark One, the Mark Two. Right. So once the the, the well the the only real evolution after that was the was the uh, white frame. Right. right. That was the the uh, which was um, electrophoretic coating. It wasn't painted. Okay. It was electrophoretic. I've got coated. fantastic white example frame. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there there you go. There's there's one. Mm. And and in fact. I, I had quite a few riders riding on these when these came out, even though there were there were uh, carbon frames then, right? And, uh, because it was it was incredibly popular. But we sold. I mean, it was incredibly popular, and they couldn't make them fast enough. Right. Literally, we you know then that would. But again, they they realised. But by then, the the nine nine two was in evolution. Okay. You know, they I'd seen the the prototypes. And, and they were incredibly exciting because they had uh, the innovation of the of the hidden headset. Right. I mean, that was it was a map. Oh, have you actually got to nine nine two for yeah. us to look at? Okay. Yeah, so so yeah. this, the, as you can see, this is the this was as far as I know the first internal headset. Right. I'm sure they did one in the 30s or 40s because there was nothing new in cycling. Whenever you saw something new, oval chainrings. Right. They did oval chainrings in the 20s. Right. You know, but. 
it rebranded, remarketed. Exactly. And, yes, right. Biopace started. Nobody bought Shim Shimano Biopace, mm. but when the oval rings and Chris 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 Room and and Bradley were using the absolute black right yes. oval rings or roto oval rings, all of a sudden, you know, they reappeared. Yeah. You know, and and oh, fantastic innovation! No, oh, not actually an innovation. You know, yeah. you know, we had that in the seventies. Nobody wanted it, and I'm yeah. sure, you know, in the same way that when Index Gear Levers came out, they where well, I can remember them appearing, and at the time I was racing first category, highest level. Everyone said, "Why would you want Index Levers? You can't feel the gear change." Yeah, you have to trim it off. Yeah, yeah and, okay. you know, you you just sort of no, 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 and and of course, the problem with the Index gearing was. They hadn't got the block chain combination quite right. Right. Nobody, nobody at that point realised that the outer cable was too flexible, so you couldn't get the accurate gear changes. Right. But Shimano worked on that, and they came out with the outer cabling where the the wires were all parallel, and so there was no compression when you pull when you change the gear lever. Right. And then and then they had their cassettes with very accurate gaps. Mm -hmm. And then indexing worked brilliantly. Yeah. And, and you started riding and you just never looked down. You clicked your gear lever. It was brilliant. Yeah. You know. One, one of the few innovations which didn't seem to uh, again have any resistance was, of course, the STI levers. Right. You know, they would just... Oh, God, yeah. Well, I mean, I stopped cycling and revisited when the levers had come in. And it was probably, yeah, it was... Is it probably one of the... The best things that that really has it yeah. yeah, and it, it, it's like it, you say. I you know I remember being young and actually looking down at my gears or swimming gears down, and it, it was really outright dangerous sometimes because your head's looking behind you, yeah. not looking in front half the time. So oh, yeah, well I can yeah. remember when Oakley brought the sunglasses out, right, and they had the, the thing underneath. Yeah, you couldn't see your gears when you looked down because oh. the bar underneath would hide your gears. You know, right. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So when they came out with the radar with yes. no no frame underneath, yes. that was brilliant because you could see your gears. Yeah. You know, but yeah. by then STI had come out, so it didn't matter. Right. You know, and then electronic gears again, they're no brainers. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, when when I mean, for, I know the purists like. I don't care. Like I haven't gone over there yet. I mean, really, I could probably even do well. well you your bike out. Seems well, just you to know, see, you, see, that's you know, it. I show, I show, I show the bike I'm currently riding. Yes. And and it's got you know disc brakes. Electric gears and all that kind of stuff, and and uh, I noted the comments. You know, how can you possibly do this in, in, in this environment? It's it's sacrilege. Yeah. Well, frankly, I don't drive around in a car with wind up wheels, wind mm. up wind up windows, and a manual gearbox, and it has air conditioning, and it has sat nav, and it has all yeah. sorts of bells and whistles because that's the technology. You know, in the same way that I don't use a landline, I use a mobile phone. Yeah. You know, I mean, te the technology has moved on, and uh, oh, definitely. So it mean, doesn't mean I don't appreciate those things. I love those things. That's yeah. why I've got the museum full of those things. And like when I come into the shop, I quite often walk and look at a particular bike and get it down and just allow the nostalgia to come to me. You know, yeah. I remember those. I remember when Campag Super Records started to do alloy brake locks and shoes. The, right. the, the shoes were alloy. When, and um, all of the things, titanium bolts. All the, I look at them and I remember all. I can remember the movement of them, and, right. and when because we were selling them. Yeah. You know, it was stock to me. I did. I wasn't in love with it in the eighties or nineties. It was just product. If I'd been a supermarket, it was just butter on the shelf. Right. Right. But by now, it's it's means something to me. You know, and I appreciate the the quality of the things that they made in those days, and the fact that you could maintain them. Yeah. You know, I mean, these days. I mean, whilst I'm lucky and I'm very, very fortunate having mechanics who can literally dismantle an STI lever, right, or an wow. ergo lever, and put them back together, we do that job for people, right? You know, and but it, most people, it's a disposable. If they, if yeah. something goes wrong with one of their levers, you buy a new lever. Yeah. The spare part for a, a current camp, a Shimano lever mm. is a lever. Yes, it's not yes. the little no, no, tiny plastic. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. not the tiny little plastic piece that breaks. Yeah, you know. So consequently, we keep all those bits. Yes. And when someone has a problem with the lever, we've got yeah, an old lever. Yeah, very expensive parts, really, yeah, for, for most people. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. So, Graham, so we, to stay on track with regards to the collection, we've got the evolution from alloy to carbon. What what happened there? What what was the model number, or what can you remember? Well, so that started with a three tube carbon frame. Okay. So basically, the C tube, top tube, and down tube. Yes. Were, were in carbon and the initial ones the initial tubing was 
uh, had a sort of orange peel effect on it. And whilst there were sort of rumours that they fell apart and all that kind of stuff, right. that wasn't actually the case. Okay. What, what normally happened was people uh, would hit a pothole really hard or they'd have a crash and that would cause a fracture in the, in the adhesive. Right. The adhesive themselves never came apart. It was, it was, it was space-age technology. It was the same yes. technology used by NASA. It was, so, yes. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, was, yeah. it, was, it, it didn't, they never broke as such. People had accidents, but of course they conveniently forgot. It's a bit like when pe yes. people have a, a, a flat in their wheel and they forget that they actually hit a pothole at 40 mile an hour going down a hill. Yes. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just, it's a faulty rim. And, and so that was just one of those things. I mean, clearly the seat lug fault was a fault, mm. a design fault. And, and you know, you, I showed you the evolution of that and yeah. how they improved it. But the, the, the tubing as such, the, whilst again, the teams had plenty of spare frames and the rumour was that they had a new frame every year and Sean, would, Sean Kelly would change his frame every, because they went soft and right. all that kind of thing. That was, that, that was just something which was um, a bit like a multi, you know, the current sort of Twitter feed yeah, yeah. stuff that you know it was, carbon, went around. You know, with carbon frames now, there's a lot going on about regards to that and how often they get changed yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so it's yeah, just, but uh, well, I mean, and you, you know what? You will never know. I know, right? right? Because it's it's all about the omerta yeah. within the pro teams. They're professionals. They're yeah. not going to say. I mean, they do occasionally. You see a rider throwing his bike away, or you know, and they've been problems these days with the new 12 speed chains coming off right and so on but but in the main professionals are professional and yeah. they're not about to say well actually it's a problem with my bike hmm. because they're they're being paid to yes. ride on that bike yeah so they don't say anything yeah. they they're, they're diplomatic they understand i mean and they're trained yeah to do that now in the old days nobody nobody was trained like that no. they, they, they didn't have media gurus telling them how to deal with things you know but, but so the, all of those were rumours. And as we were at the pointed end of that with right. writers, we knew what happened. I mean, the biggest repair we did was replacing the rear hanger. Right. Right. Cause, because, in, and, and that was the forerunner of all of the rear hangers which broke rather than breaking your frame. So now yeah. when you see a carbon frame, it has this sacrificial rear end. Yes, it does, yeah. Because the alternative is a £4,000 frame, a £3,000 frame breaks because you put your gears in your wheel. Yes. And of course, it was faulty gears. It wasn't your gear change, you know, yeah. your adjustment to the gears. You know? Yeah. So this was the big thing. And in fact, I, um, one of the one of my trips to Saint Etienne was to be. T I was taught how to do the repairs, how to repair the the fork ends, because we were sending frames back to France to have a new fork end fitted, and it was a twenty minute repair. Right. So you can imagine the cost you know a box with five frames I mean, we waited till we had a box of five frames and shipped them back to france yeah then they repaired them then they shipped them back so it was hundreds of pounds to do this minor repair so i went over there they taught me how to do them and it was really straightforward it was just a question of following the procedure right fastening the thing back together and i used to i did that i actually did the repairs you know I, we had a jig we put them in tightened up and did it and and that so what was a two hundred pound repair, or maybe a hundred pound. I don't remember exactly. We could do for twenty quid. Okay. Because and I had a and it made sense for gas. Obviously, Absolutely. not shipping it for the customer in the time it took and everything else. Yeah, so and that and, and I would say of all the repairs I did, 90, 99 percent of them were rear gear hanger replacements. Right. Okay. So, so anyway, the, so the evolution into carbon, right? There was initially the three tube version, right? Which the pros loved because it was more rigid. And then the nine tube, and then the, the the only criticism was that the rear triangle still was a little bit flexible, um, and so then they it evolved to the carbon nine, right. which was obviously the six tubes on the rear of the frame. Right. Yes. Two tubes above the brake bridge, two tubes below, and two seat stays. Yes. So that was the carbon nine. Nice. Then they introduced Kevlar. I, I, I've actually got the carbon nine. Carbon yeah. nine. Yes. The, well, this is carbon three. Right. Okay. Um, I haven't actually got a carbon nine. Yeah. Um, no real reason. I've just no. never come across one. Okay. I mean, it, I, I, in the same way that I said to you on the last video, I had a white one, a white nine seven nine, and yes. now you've seen it. Yes. You know, um, you just wait for these pe these things to appear on eBay or the various forums in the in Europe, yes. and if you and if it's what you want and it's not ridiculously priced, I buy them for the I buy yeah. them for the museum. 
Um, so about, about rare ones, what's, what's well, the most rarest? The, so when they introduced the Kevlar, yeah. they, they, the Kevlar uh, w was available in different colours, I, I guess. And I can remember again going to the factory and seeing um, the yellow, which so you saw the tubing with the yellow in. Okay. And I can show you that here, that's, that's yeah. this. Um, but there was also red and blue. Right. Now, as a, an Evertonian, I wanted a blue one. Right. And, and, obviously. Uh, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And because I certainly didn't want a red one. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, comments below. Okay. You know. And um, although at the end of this season, there's nothing to brag about oh. being an Evertonian, but there we go. Um, so, the, the, I was in, at, the, at San Etienne and they were showing me the, the various tubes, and I immediately said, Oh, I love the blue one. I definitely want make me a make me a 56. Carbon nine with the blue for okay. me. I would. I definitely want one. And uh, and then there was the red. So, but the yellow was popular, and the black and yellow looked really good. Right. The red they did a small number of, and uh, and I've got one a complete bike in okay. the red, with with a full Mavic uh, Starfish group on. Nice. Beautiful. And and that's quite rare. I think I'd only I've only actually come across one or two. We didn't have that many to sell, and the blue never arrived. Okay. We never saw them. Whether I d I'm not sure they even made any. Right. I think the, just the tube that with the blue in was as far as it went. Right. So that was the, and that was really the zenith of the 979, the carbon nine. Like. Right. And after them came the 992. Right. Um, the 992 alloy was introduced whilst the 979 was still, still running, and they ran ran in parallel. Uh, but it was a, a obviously had the innovation of the hidden. The hidden uh, headset, right? But many of the parts were very similar. Okay. Right, very similar. But the evolution of it uh, with the aerodynamic head tube, so the head tube was, were, you know, that that were they were just sort of. I thought aesthetic, but of right. course now, of course, aerodynamics is a much, it's a much bigger thing. Yes. And yes. and and uh, so the nine seven nine alloy, and there were all the different colours and so on. And the uh, and then the car the the oval tube ovoid tubing sorry not oval right said ovoid I mean that was to make them more rigid right so th they were they were attacking the problem of the not that the frames aren't that rigid in two ways going to carbon and also going to the different shape of alloy tubing right so okay. and as well the actually the inlay tubing that came in a lot earlier rather than the actual tubing itself didn't it yeah so so and then there was a carbon nine seven nine. Right, and that was the frame that uh, Andre Schmiel won Paris Roubaix on red and black. Okay. Lotto team red and black Vitus, uh, carbon nine, and so on. Yeah. And I don't have one of them either because they were very rare. Right, They're, and again they were at the tail end of our agency, so we were only just sort of getting one or two of them. They were painted, right, which was again unusual, you know, because it, it added to the weight. Paint is, paint is quite heavy. Yes, you know. Yes, and there were never any actual bare carbon. 992s. I think around that time, TVT were had the painted frames. You remember Le Monde riding on one, yes. and, and um, Indurain and Bernesto, right? Uh, and and uh, Ulrich for TVT for um, what they call Telecom. Right. They all had the painted TVTs. Yes. So, so that was you know, and so that was you know that was another evolution. Of a different company in that same area, yes. you know that, that was Mavic TVT look. You know they they were all sort of interrelated in some way. Yeah. Certainly, the guy who designed Time pedals was the same guy who transferred the concept of the ski binding to Look pedals. Yes, and when he oh, okay. when he left uh, Look and set up Time, right, and then TVT was something to do with him as well, and then they went back to Look. Yes, and look started doing frames. It, they, they were all French people. Yeah. They all knew each other. They all were in that area. I mean, CLB, Badour, and Vitus were all in a, a region, a, an area uh, of of, Vite, of um, sorry Saint Etienne called Saint Chamond. Right. They were all the four factories were all close by. Yeah. You know, sort of. If you were talking about Manchester, they were all in Didsbury. Right. Kind yeah. of thing. With close right? proximity. Close yeah. proximity, yeah. and they all knew each other. Right. You know. I mean, in the in the same way. Fun, funnily enough, there was a the, a pink, a pink nine seven nine. I saw. Wow. Okay. Now I've they, seen one of them. Well, very very rare. Yeah. And they were made to be used by Mercier. 
Okay. Because as you remember, Mercier always had pink frames. Yeah. In fact, I've got a Mercier, my Barry Hoban tri tribute bike. Okay. Right. Right. And and they did alloy frames in pink. Very very few. Mercier were initially a massive company, but the, 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 for some reason went in the wrong direction. Okay. And and they were going out of business. And one of the things that they tried to do was to bring themselves up to date with the 979 frame, but it was clearly too late. Yeah. But I I've I've see, I saw one. I've never actually seen one for sale. I think I saw one in a forum discussion, and I you know gave my two pence worth of information about them. Right. I'd, I've I've actually saw. I think I saw some at the factory. They were never offered to us because they weren't. It wasn't a commercially available as such. It was just for Mercier. Yeah. In the same way, initially. Blue Vitas were only available as Jetain. Right. Or Motorbicane, or I can't I don't right, remember okay. which. But certainly they made the blue one for somebody yes. specifically. And and for whatever yeah, reason. Yeah, or are they coming in that sort of bulk bought that, yeah. that whole colour yeah. up and No no. And there were the, there were I mean there were other manufacturers who were running in parallel. Cadex. They mm. made alloy frames. And in fact I've got a Cadex carbon. Mm. Incredibly rare. I mean I I literally I'd never even seen one. And then I came across this one, and there it is. I've never actually built it up as a bike right. because I'm, I'm not sure what to put on it. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it would have to be a Spidel group, maybe a Simplex Spidel group would be would be correct for this for this frame. Right. You know, but, uh, so with all this success with Vitus, what actually happened once you lost the brand itself? Then, well, we had a lot of stock. So clearly we weren't we weren't about to run out of stock, but we couldn't order any more. Uh, so I looked around for a replacement, and the obvious replacement was Allen, the Italian manufacturer. Um, so I went at the, at the uh, Milan show that year. I went I went onto the stand <coughs> and had initial discussion with the salesman there. And uh, initially, of course, initially they didn't real realize the magnitude of what I, they were looking at. Someone wanted to buy. Maybe five or six hundred frames. So as soon as I started talking about that, all of a sudden, the uh, Ludovic Falcone or Ludovico Falcone, he he came out to talk to me, and uh, I told him what I wanted to do, and uh, what we did, and he was excited. I gave him an order for a, l a large order, and we we then embarked on selling Allen frames. So we had the, we then had Allen frames in alloy and carbon, and it gave us access to cyclocross. And so on, but by then the monocoque frames were starting to appear, right. and in fact, the uh, my partners and the people I worked with in Belgium were actually manufacturing a full monocoque carbon frame, right? And I was actually riding one, right? You okay. know, so so that, I mean, and that was the movement forward, yeah. And and uh, other companies, certainly the Americans were big in the market then, and all of a sudden, Trek and Giant and all of these people had carbon frames, and they'd had. The, uh, sort of copies specialized if you remember did an alice alley frame yes which was alloy alloy and carbon yeah so the, the, they were they were dipping their toe in this market they were having them manufactured probably by litage Sac right. i mean there's a whole nother story right okay. you know the, i mean the, there's there's the sakai litage frame which i've got an example of right you know and that that was um that was a whole different parallel evolution if you right. like but in japan okay you know but anyway the the uh, so we had Allen frames and and we sold them until they stopped being what people wanted to buy and that phased out and we sold them off and then we were selling monocoque frames and, we right. were, and by then of course we also had the eight five three started to appear right okay. and and that was so light so so great to ride fantastic tubing yeah. that that became de rigueur that's right. what the pro team started to use. Right. And so on, and and uh, they they were used certainly by the the bright team that I was involved with in 1998. Yes, you know we had eight five three frames, right. which Paul Donahue made. They, again, they had bright as a branding on the frame, and yes. you know I've got the couple you can see. Yes, we did actually cover that on a previous video. Yeah, uh, regarding but it said bright it because uh, the, because it was such a high budget team. That it was too expensive for me to put Graham Way on, which right. I would have loved to have. Yes, but it was just too expensive, you know. Renault, it's so Bright put their name on, and right. that was it. So, okay. so, uh, so that was that was the, the the evolution. So, what advice could you give to anyone who was actually looking for a second hand 
fighter's frame? Is it is there any sort of advice or you know what what would you look out for? Would you say it's uh... right? Well, yes, there are several things that you would look for. Obviously, I've mentioned the the uh, the old seat lug, so yes. you'd look very carefully to see if there was any evidence of a crack. Right. Um, yeah, that, that's on the Mark One. On the two. Mark One. Yeah. yeah. And then the check that the the uh, all three top tube cable guides are present. If it's that. Right. Because yes, they good... they were glued and screwed. Right. There was a tiny little self tapping screw which held them on, and I would think it'd be impossible to find one of those if it was missing. Right. But you could certainly glue it back on. Okay. Um, and then with the next ones, you want to check that the tubes that come out the frame that the cable goes into are in good condition. Yeah. But most importantly, on the second evolution of 979s, make sure you have an Allen key with you and check that the seat, that the grub screw in the seat tube will come out. Right. Because, as you can imagine, in that position, it's very vulnerable to corrosion. Okay. Right, so if you're riding, as you would be, without mud guards, every single drop of water that comes off of your back wheel yeah. hits that seat lug. And the mud right. hits that seat lug. So you need to make sure that that will come out. That's important. Okay. And then look around the the, the uh, lug joints, right? And see how neat the glue is. Okay. If the, in fact, if you can see any glue, yeah. If you can see glue, the chances are it's been repaired. Right. Right. Yes. And and then of course you've got to question the reliability of of something. Whether it would be as good a repair. Whether they've whoever's repaired it did it properly. Yes. You know, you've yeah. got to clean out the old glue. You've got to make sure that when you look at these. When you look at the joints, there is no evidence of yeah. glue because of the, any 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 contamination will affect the way the glue works. Yeah. Although the the glue itself evolved, initially it was grey, then it was clear, and and in that period there were improvements to the glue so that it, it worked even better. But as I said before, the glue seldom failed right. of its own accord. It yeah. would be a crash or something like that. Right. Check that the, the frames in line as well. Of course, if you if you know how to do that. Um, yeah. So you know, but though, uh, there's not a lot you can say because they they don't they, they, there's no rusting. They don't rust no. from the inside. I mean, if you're buying a 50 year old Reynolds frame, yes, the, there's a fair chance that in some places could be rusted inside only the, out. So. Only the paint is holding the frame together. Yeah, you know, yeah. because they they do rust from the inside. There was no galvanizing. There was no no uh, treatment, wax oiling, or no treatment of the inside of the tubes. No one thought of that in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. You know, and, and the, the reason, one of the reasons you don't see many of those frames is they literally rusted away. Yeah. You know, people left them in their in their shed for twenty or thirty years. When they came back to them, you know, everything yeah. seized up. <laughs> the tubes, you know, then the tubes went. It was very thin tubing, after all. Yeah. Yes, you it know. was. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think that's it. Regards to Vitus bikes. Uh, for now, I'm sure that we're going to be revisiting and uh, talking some more with Graham. Um, so thanks so much for your time again thanks so much for watching please like share and subscribe and uh, bye for now